This uh, medical disclaimer, personal disclaimer information is not to substitute for uh, any type of direct medical advice, but I encourage you to talk to your personal physician as you work through these things. And also, uh, I have no financial disclosures. Uh, so uh, we'll get right into it. Uh, and I'll go ahead and tell you right now, we're just gonna scratch the surface tonight. Uh, so perhaps I'll tell you in advance, perhaps if you want more of these type of messages, maybe you can uh, just make a note on your envelope that this is something that you may be interested in and we can see if we can make that available for you in the future. So look, so today more than ever before, we are in an age of interconnectivity. And, you know, unlike ever before as well, all of the information that we could ever think of that has ever been is right at our fingertips. It's right at our fingertips. And right in these devices, as a matter of fact, um, whether you can even call up food um, these days. But it's interesting that in this, what we call information age, in this information age, unlike never before, we are one of the most confused societies that's ever been. It's the paradox of the age that it's the information age, but we are confused. And so, and it's really interesting to me that those of us, particularly our, our young people who have the greatest access to this information, seem to be the most confused. And so I like to call this not the information age, but the misinformation age. And so it's very difficult to tell what is the difference between fact and fiction. And sadly enough, even in my own field of medicine, there is a lot of misinformation that is going around, and in, even in basic science. But let me tell you, folks, there is nothing new under the sun. And this has been going on for years, four years, where people will try to take medical facts and they will twist them to fit their own um, desired ends for the sake of big business, for, for profits or what have you. But what I want to communicate to you tonight is that when it comes to your health, we cannot have any guesswork. We need to be able to distinguish between truth and error because we're dealing with issues of life and death, literally life and death. And so my first point to you, my first take home point for you is that you must begin, I must begin, we all must begin to take our own health into our own hands. No one would ever advocate for you like you. No one will ever care for you like you, except Jesus. But, but we have to become intelligent with regard to our health. Now, our discussion tonight is going to be uh, fourfold from here. Uh, we've talked about taking your health in your own hands. We'll talk about a thought question to get us thinking, models for wellness, the optimal keys for health, and strengthening and weakening. That's what we're going to discuss tonight. And again, we're just going to scratch the surface, so um, maybe there'll be more to come. So here is my thought question. Let's just say that there were three people, three co-workers. They all grew up in the same city, same high school. They got the same job. Imagine those three people all going to someone's house for a dinner, for example. OK, they go to someone's house for dinner. And so you have these three people. Now, unfortunately, unbeknownst to them, someone at that house is sick. All three people get exposed to the same pathogen at that house at the same time. Now, person number one, they start to feel bad. They maybe have to call in from work because they're so sick. And slowly over a period of days, they slowly get better. Maybe they're under a fog for a little while, but eventually they get better, they make a full recovery. All right, that's person number one. Person number two, remember, three people, same age, roughly equal health, same background. They get sick as well, but this person doesn't make the recovery like person number one. They actually get even sicker and they have to be admitted to the hospital. And unfortunately for person number two, they end up dying from the same sickness that person number one recovered from. And then we have person number three. 
Person number three gets sick. But unlike person number one, number two, he never really starts feeling bad. He just exposed to the same pathogen. But then he wakes up following days, business as usual. In fact, over the period of time, he's living his best life. All three people, all exposed to the same environmental factors, all three people with a similar background, but three different results. And the question that I want us to think about, and we know situations like this, we hear about it in the news all the time. What makes the difference between person number one, person number two, and person number three, with those three different outcomes? So in order to answer that question, I want to challenge how we think about health. And so most of us have somewhat of a binary model of health. Binary means on or off. And so we have, we are in a state of health until at some point we start to feel sick. Maybe I have a sore throat, maybe I have a headache, maybe I have an ache here or there. And so that symptom causes me to go to my doctor. My doctor says, hey, you have this diagnosis and then we have a disease. And then we can either recover from that disease or get worse. But I want to challenge you that this is an incomplete, this is an incomplete idea, model of health. What I want to present to you is a continual model of health. You have perfect health, which is an ideal. I don't know that there's anyone among us who can claim perfect health, but you have optimal health. Let's call it optimal health. And then the first thing that can happen in optimal health is you can have sickness you can have like person number three something that invades the body but you may not ever know about it it's what we call a subclinical illness and that can either get better or get worse but at some point even if it sub starts off subclinical if it gets worse then you will start to have symptoms then you'll start to know hmm, something's wrong and you'll start to have symptoms and then just like can either recover from it or not. And when we overlay these two models, when we overlay these two models, you notice something different in the middle. They both have symptoms. They both go to the doctors, get diagnosed. But there's this window between when you actually become sick and when your body actually catches, when you realize, your body knows about it, but when you realize that window I like to call functional illness. That means I'm sick, but I'm still functioning. I may not know about it, but I'm still able to go to work, do my daily activities. And I would like to challenge you that this is what makes the difference between person number one, person number two, person number three, because the body, the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. The body, believe it or not, is made to heal itself. The body is is made to recover. And there is mechanisms in that to do that. I think we lost our feed here. But, but what is the determination, what determines our position on that continuum? Well, this is what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. Psalm 134, 14, 439, 14 says, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And God has made within us, within you, within each and every one of us, an immune system. And tonight we're going to talk about that immune system and what we can do to make it stronger. So I entitled it, Your Key to Optimum Health. So most of the time when we talk about and think about the immune system, we think about our white blood cells, which is part of our innate immunity. This is the nonspecific immunity that you have. No matter what pathogen you come across, your body has these amazing cells. I have no time to talk about it, but they're amazing how they work to attack the, that disease, that virus, and to deal with it. But once you get sick and your body recovers, you have something called acquired immunity from your adaptive immune system. And that's when your body remembers the sicknesses you get. Like when you had chicken pox as a child, 
your body remembers that. And so even if you come in contact with chickenpox now, you have something called antibodies that can be made to deal with that. But the immune system is so much more than that. Your whole body is designed to fend off sickness. You have your skin, which is a barrier that protects you. So if I get sickness on my skin, I can wash it off. I never know I had it. There's a mucous membrane that li lines your nose all the way down to your lungs, including your GI passages as well. And you have all of these various organs, bone marrow, spleen, uh, thymus, lymph nodes, lymphatic vessels, all a part of that immune system. But even beyond that, there are 37 trillion with a T cells in your body. And each one of those cells is designed to live, is designed to fend off disease. And in order for you to get sick, the virus has to penetrate that cell membrane and infect the cell. And so each cell in and of itself has defense mechanisms about it. Then you have the liver and the sweat glands and the kidneys and the various detoxification system, the white blood cells we've already talked about. And then these amazing chemical defenses that your body can use to use secrete acid, to use hydrogen peroxide all inside the body to kill and destroy invading pathogens. So in fact, what I'm telling you is that you yourself are the immune system. But <clears throat> the most important organ of the immune system I haven't even mentioned yet. And this is what I want to focus in on today. The most important organ of the immune system is the brain. The brain, because the brain controls all of those mechanisms. But for a second reason, the brain is important because you make the decisions. You have the power to make the decisions to build up that immune system or to bring it down. I'm going to repeat that. You have the power to build up the immune system or to weaken it down. And so for the next few minutes, 13 minutes to be exact, we're going to talk about strengthening the immune system, what strengthens it and what weakens it. Again, I wish I can go more in depth. We're just going to glide across the surface and we are going to just hit some high points. So the first thing that that weakens the immune system or can strengthen it is our diet, our diet. And in today's society, in our fast paced society, we have a tendency to eat highly processed foods. We all do it, self included. I'm guilty. Sometimes I will eat highly processed foods, but what those foods lack is nutrient content or high nutrient content. But when we eat foods with low nutrient content, it weakens our immune system because there are certain uh, vitamins and things that are required to strengthen it. So again, if we eat foods that are low in mineral and vitamin content, we weaken the immune system. Also, if we expose ourselves to toxins, that could be in our environment or it could be in our food. There are certain times I've once picked up a potato chip. Okay, I won't say the name of it, but I picked up the, the bag. Actually, it was a can. And I read it and there were some words that I really struggled to pronounce. And again, that can't be natural. And it, those, some of those things are not highly toxic, but they're subtly toxic to our systems. Also things that are difficult for our body to digest are, can weaken the immune system. A very big one that I personally kind of battle with is sugar. Sugar, there have been studies that have presented that when you are exposed to sugar, and it's amazing to me that we're not hearing more about this in the news, in the media, that one of the things you should always do if you find yourself coming down with sickness is immediately stop sugar intake because sugar intake, it weakens, it demonstrably weakens the immune system. And not, not only does it weaken it for that moment, but it can have a prolonged effect for many days. One sugary meal can have a prolonged effect over, I, I believe the study said up to five days, weakening the immune system. And so and a, sugar often comes disguised, not as table sugar, 
but it comes again in the highly processed foods. They kind of mask it, even in that potato chip, uh, one of those long words in the potato chips uh, can I was looking at is maltodextrin, and that is a sugar disguised. High, fruct high fructose corn syrup is another sugar that's disguised. Anyway, moving on, lack of sleep is a big one. And again, as a physician, I live with lack of sleep. But when I was talking to my physician recently, she told me that, she said, Dr. Swain, you're really gonna have to improve on this one because there's just too much evidence. There's too much evidence in medical literature that lack of sleep, it weakens the immune system. Not only does that, lack of sleep is a, there's a direct linkage between sleep deprivation and early dementia. And so that's a very important one for strengthening, or if we don't do it, weakening the immune system. And lastly, stress. Stress is one that we kind of ignore because we all deal with it to a certain degree, but stress can weaken the immune system like nothing else. I would almost say like anything else on that list cannot supersede what stress can do to your immune system. And when you look at this list, one great example of all these things is in World War I. World War I was a time of great stress. It was a time of distress. And not only that, if you research that, because I'm sure none of us were alive during that time, they actually had to start rationing food, especially in the European theater, because of the war effort. And so you would see advertisements saying that you need to start preserving your food. And so they started making more preservatives to make the little food that they had last. They were limiting food. And at the same time, people had to line up and struggle to get food. Now, when you look at this, more preservatives, more toxins to the body, uh, more stress, uh, poor diets, what was the result of this? There's been many uh, scientists and researchers who directly link the pandemic, the flu pandemic of 1918 to what happened during the war because of that decline in their nutrition, higher stress, less sleep, and the like. And that is kind of what we're seeing today in a, in a roundabout way. History is kind of re repeating itself. Now, what about strengthening the immune system? Uh, so again, there's many things that we can look at, but just a maybe four I want to leave you with tonight is vitamin C, vitamin C. And when I, when I speak of vitamin C or what have you, I want us to think of getting these things in a whole food because vitamin C, if I take a pill, it's just isolated vitamin C. But if we get that vitamin C the way that God gave it to us, it has many other phytonutrients and things that we don't even understand that help to support that vitamin C and make it more bioavailable to the body. But vitamin C is directly antimicrobial. It stimulates the immune system, specifically your white blood cells. Vitamin D is one that I could probably do a whole lecture, not probably a series of lectures on vitamin D alone. It is an immunomodulator, means it, it revs up the immune system. Beyond that, it supports the T cells and it makes, it's responsible for the formation or the one of the building blocks of two chemicals in your body uh, that are listed here that are destructive to uh, microbial elements that enter the body. Vitamin D is a real big one. Vitamin A also is important for your mucal membrane health. And then there is zinc. Zinc is also an immune booster and it specifically um, boosts your T cells. And it can also turn on your immune system as well and also help to stop viral replication in the body. And one last one I want to give to you is, is garlic. Garlic is a very, very important um, food that we all have access to. It is, at the, once, it is antimicrobial, antiviral, antifungal. 
and it also makes our food taste good. Not so much for the breath, but it makes the food taste very good. Um, but it's really good for you as far as strengthening your immune system. So unfortunately, my our time is far spent, far spent. But again, I'm hoping tonight just whets your appetite because again, if you want more lectures like these, maybe we can go a little bit further in depth. Just make a note on your card to say, hey, I would be interested if something like this came to the community uh, where we can talk a little bit more in depth because here we are just touching the very, very tip. I mean, not even the down to the water, just the very upper tip of the iceberg. And hopefully we can have some more in the future. Thank you guys very much for your time. Again, sorry we have to hit it so slightly, but, but take home points I would like you guys to take is number one, I want you to take your health into your own hands. Do your research, do your due diligence. You know, we'll, we'll research for days before, for months even, for, before we buy a TV or a car or something like that. How much more should we be taking our own health into our own hands? Also, I want us to be intentional. I want us to start um, trying to get out the processed foods and to get some of these vitamins and nutrients to strengthen our immune systems. Thank you very much.